Our most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us here today, even here in the parking lot. Uh, thank you for uh, your goodness in giving us this day, a day to reflect on your goodness and your redemptive work that was accomplished in Christ Jesus. Thank you that we are reconciled to you through the gospel, and not only reconciled to you, but reconciled to all of your children, including one another as a local assembly of believers. Thank you, Father, for calling us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Thank you for the grace that has washed us clean and has given us life. Oh Lord, as we consider everything going on in our country today, our hearts are, are filled with grief when we look at the world. But what a great motivation to keep our hearts and our minds set on you and your promises. So we pray today, Lord, that as we, as we gather, we would remember your promises. We would remember your redemptive work. We would remember what you have called us to and what you have called us from. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in the state of California where the governor has forbidden that they sing praises to you. And we ask, Lord, that they would have the courage, the boldness, the audacity to defy their governor and to sing praises to you. We pray for their governor and we pray for his salvation. We pray that he would govern wisely. We pray that he would turn from his foolishness, instructing your people to do something that you instruct us to do. And we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in his salvation. If you would draw him to Christ, that he would govern wisely. We also pray for our own local leaders. We pray for their salvation. We pray for their uh, for the counsel that they surround themselves with. And we pray, Lord, that we pray that you would save them. We pray that you would call them out of darkness by your grace, just as you have called us out of darkness by your grace. And for our president, we pray the same thing. And for our vice president and for our judges. Oh, Father, the darkness in our, in our country, in our culture, in our land at this time is overwhelming. But we know that your grace is greater. We know that your power is greater. We know that your kingdom is greater and that your kingdom will never be shaken, even if the kingdom on earth that we live in right now should fall. Yours never will. What great confidence that gives us, Father. Teach us in these circumstances, in these times, to be hungry and to long for your everlasting kingdom and to live our lives in light of that citizenship before our citizenship on earth. And now, Lord, as we come to your holy word, we thank you for it. We remember that it is inerrant that it is inspired, that it is infallible, and that it is sufficient to instruct us in every way of life. And so we ask, Lord, that as we study your word, that you would give us understanding, that we may grow in the likeness of Christ, that we may honor him and glorify him with our lives. We also pray for our children who are here, Lord. We also ask that you would draw them to Christ in due time. We pray for their salvation. We pray for many seeds to be planted until that time, until you cause the harvest of faith in their hearts to grow. Oh Lord, use this time to glorify Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to John chapter 8. We will be looking, actually, starting at, uh, in, in chapter 7, uh, with the final verse in chapter 7. But we'll be looking at uh, John chapter 7, verse 53, through John chapter 8, verse 11. You know, when we started our study on the book of John, I, I did have a little bit of an apprehension, um, something that, that intimidated me just a little bit. Uh, and that was knowing that I would eventually have to preach on and, and cover the passage that we come to today. And I know that that's a very strange thing for a, a pastor or for a preacher to say, but I hope to explain my apprehension as we go through this passage today. Uh, if you have a Bible in your hands, um, you might notice that the text in John went from either regular text, um, or it went from regular text to either italic text or bracketed text. I've got one of the Bibles from inside the foyer here, and right before verse 15, 53, there's a bracket, and right after verse 11, there's the closed bracket. So between verse uh, chapter 7, verse 53, and chapter 8, verse 11, uh, maybe you'll find a footnote, um, but there, the, the fact that those things are there, either italic text or brackets, tells us there's something that we should know about this text. Um, if you do have a footnote in your text, uh, it will probably say something like not found in the earliest manuscripts. This one says, um, later manuscripts add the story of the adulterous woman, numbering it as John 7, 53 to 8, 11. Your Bible probably says something very similar to that. Uh, and, and that is a very, very significant detail uh, as we come to a passage like this. And it makes this passage somewhat difficult or, or even controversial to preach. There are people out there who won't preach this text. I will. Uh, but there are, there are plenty of people out there who won't preach this text, not because it isn't a beautiful passage. Indeed, it, it really is. This is a, a beautiful passage. And it's not because it's a passage that tends to make people feel very uncomfortable. It, it usually doesn't. The thing that makes this controversial or difficult to preach is the fact that we don't know if this passage actually belongs in our Bibles in the first place. And there are a few passages and verses like this in the New Testament, verses that were not found, that have not been found in the earliest manuscripts. Uh, one of them, for example, is at the end of Mark. Uh, you may remember, if you've, if you've been with us for many years, many years ago, I preached uh, the gospel according to Mark. And uh, when we got to the end, I spent the majority of that final sermon covering the end passage, explaining not only why that passage shouldn't be included in the text, but, how, but also how knowing that it shouldn't be in the text actually increases our confidence in Scripture rather than causing <clears throat> our confidence in Scripture to decrease. So maybe the first question that you have as we come to the text, uh, with that kind of understanding, with the understanding that maybe it shouldn't be in there, is why is it even in there? Uh, how did it get there in the first place? I think that's a very good question to start with. That's a fair question. And the answer is that it eventually just made its way into the text that monks and scribes used to copy. Uh, they didn't have photocopiers uh, before the 20th century. Uh, people copied stuff by hand until the printing press basically was invented. But somewhere along the line, somebody was making a copy of John's gospel by hand, and they probably put this story in there as a side note in the margins. And when somebody else took that copy to make a copy for themselves, they probably figured that the first person had meant to include this story in the text. And so they copied it down as if it were part of the text. And then two people made copies of that copy and 10 people made copies of those copies and so on and so forth. And so we have this in our Bibles. Now, it's entirely possible, actually, that this story actually did take place, that it, that it took place and was passed down not 
on uh, not on parchment, not on paper, but through oral tradition. Um, even if John didn't actually write this, it's possible that this is an event that really did happen. Um, as we'll see when we go through this passage, Jesus doesn't speak uncharacteristically in this passage, although he does act in a way that we never see him acting anywhere else in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that is when he stoops down and starts writing in the sand. But when he does that, we aren't told why he's writing in the sand and we're not told what he wrote in the sand. But the idea that this was passed down for over 300 years through oral tradition it's a little bit unlikely, but we do have to consider it to at least be a possibility. Now, you probably realize that we don't possess any of the original manuscripts. In other words, we don't have the actual paper that John wrote on or that Matthew, Mark, Luke, Paul, James, any of the biblical authors wrote on. What we have are copies and copies of copies. And when you add them up, what you find is that we have actually tens of thousands of copies of the original manuscripts dating from the first to the 15th centuries AD for the New Testament and dating from the fourth century BC to the 15th century AD for the Old Testament. And when you look at all of these ancient manuscripts, they are very, very similar. There is there are remarkably very, very, very few differences among all of these copies. The differences that do exist are typically things like misspelled words or words being repeated like the, the, or something like that. The author or the, the, the scribe who copied it only meant to write it once, but for whatever reason, he wrote it twice. Or maybe words are copied slightly out of order. Um, instead of saying he said, it'll say said he or something like that. So just copied out of order. But there are no differences, we must realize. When you look at all the manuscripts, there are no differences that affect or bring into to question any doctrines. That's a very important detail. There are no doctrines that get, uh, that get affected at all by the fact that there are these minor differences uh, basically due to human error. In the 1500s, a man by the name of Erasmus took all of the copies that were available uh, to people at that time, um, all the copies of ancient manuscripts, and he compiled what was referred to as the Textus Receptus, which just means the received text. Uh, this was way, way before the age of archaeology, uh, when we started find, finding, uh, you know, really early, very early biblical manuscripts. Once we started finding these ancient, very early biblical manuscripts through archaeological discovery, we started using those to help us figure out uh, how accurate the later manuscripts were. Uh, there were they, they were very, very, very accurate most of the time. And with so many manuscripts to work with, uh, you know, far, far more than Erasmus had in the 1500s, we started developing what's known as the majority text. The majority text takes all of these ancient manuscripts that we now possess and it compares all the differences, the errors, by, you know, due to human, due to human error, uh, normally choosing one as the correct reading over another based on which occurs the most. But there's another option when you're doing this type of thing, not only to see what's in the most texts, but to see what's in the earliest texts. So for, let's, let's say, for example, you have 5,000 manuscripts uh, that say, he said, and 1,000 manuscripts that say he believed. It doesn't say he said, it says he believed. They would go typically with the one uh, that was found more frequently in, in more copies, he said. Now there's a, a New Testament scholar by the name of Daniel Wallace. For those of you who are in seminary and uh, will be taking Greek, or, or maybe you have taken Greek in, in Jordan's case, you'll, you'll undoubtedly become very familiar with him in his work, as his book on Greek is recognized as one of the best, uh, the best Greek syntax textbooks. It's called Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, an exegetical syntax of the New Testament with scripture, subject, and Greek word indexes. Now, if you think that sounds like 
a great book to fall asleep to, you're probably right. It's really only for seminary students and, uh, and Greek scholars. Uh, Dr. Wallace, though, is famous for his work in this field. He illustrates this process for how we got our Bibles today by doing seminars that he calls the Gospel According to Snoopy. Uh, Dr. Wallace explains uh, how this works on his website, and here's what his website says. He says, quote, here's the basic idea. On Friday night, I will teach some of the basics of New Testament textual criticism. Then I ask for 22 people to volunteer to be scribes. They go into a separate room and copy out a short text in English, each with specific instructions designed to increase errors in the copying process and corrupt the text. The text goes through six generations of copying. Meanwhile, the rest of the people, the textual critics, are trying to reconstruct the genealogy of the transmission of the text, namely, which scribe copied from whom, and think through what kinds of skills and biases the scribes would have brought to their tasks. On Saturday morning, Remember, this started uh, Friday evening. On Saturday morning, we will all get together and the textual critics get busy working on the remaining manuscripts that the scribes produced. Unfortunately, most of the earliest manuscripts have strangely disappeared overnight, including all first generation copies. The textual critics do the best they can with the manuscripts they've got to work with. They record all the variants, and there are always more variants than words in the original text. But unlike New Testament textual criticism, the variants are usually meaningful. The vast bulk of New Testament textual variants are not. The textual critics work in small groups for about three hours. They debate, wrestle with a variety of possibilities about corruption and which manuscripts are more corrupt than others. All of them are corrupt to some degree and try to determine the wording of the original gospel according to Snoopy. Then all the groups get together and I function as secretary. I write down the major variants on a whiteboard and list what the whole group thinks is the original wording in each place. When I get done posting the variants, the whiteboard is a mess. No one is confident that they've reconstructed the text of Snoopy exactly. Then a miracle happens. The original text of Snoopy is discovered, and they can compare how they did. How close do they get? End quote. Now on his website, he just kind of leaves it. He says that he's going to leave that answer for the seminar. But I've, uh, I've heard people speak who have been to these seminars, and so I know what the answer is. He reveals that the worst that any group has ever done was get three words wrong. And that only happened one time since the 80s. Three, three words, one time. But these are amateurs that we're talking about. They're not professional scholars. These are amateurs who are simply using common sense and logic and reason to do what biblical scholars do. And they prove that it's, you know, it is a tedious work, but it is possible to figure out exactly what was originally written. What this proves is that our Bibles today, your Bible that you're holding in your hand, is incredibly, incredibly precise, very accurate. In fact, over 99.9% .9 accurate. That last 0.1%, that's, that's a tenth of 1%, that last 0.1% that's questionable is stuff that doesn't really carry any weight in the text. Sometimes it's something as simple as whether or not the word and should be included or the word the should be included. Those things are kind of, we would say, doctrinally insignificant. And thus, we can trust our Bibles as we read them today with our lives, trust them with our lives and with our souls. Now, before we take a look at the text before us today, I wanna to say a few things about this text in light of the fact that we're now aware of the fact that it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts and it didn't show up for over 300 years. Uh, the first thing I wanna say is that there is no other ancient text aside from the Bible that even comes close to being as accurate as the ancient biblical manuscripts are. The next closest is Homer's Iliad with 643 ancient manuscripts. Keep in mind, we have tens of thousands of ancient biblical manuscripts. Homer's Iliad has 643 ancient manuscripts, which contains some very significant differences, but 
nobody doubts or questions what Homer's Iliad says. The ancient manuscripts of the Iliad aren't anywhere near as close to, to resembling one another as the ancient manuscripts of the Bible are. So if we can trust the Iliad as being accurate, as scholars do, there is no reason to ever think that we also cannot trust our Bibles. Secondly, we should note that there are, in fact, very, very reputable, very good sound teachers who think that the text that we're coming to today does belong in the Bible. So this is not a, a black and white issue. This is not something where there, there's a, a unanimous consensus. Uh, R.C. Sproul believed that it belonged in the text. Uh, I believe John MacArthur also believes that this belongs in the text. Uh, there are far more scholars who doubt that it belongs, but my point is that there's room to fall on either side here. I personally, um, if you want to know where I stand, I find myself on the side of the camp that says, you know, it most likely doesn't belong here, but there are good scholars and sound teachers who believe that it does. Third, there are no doctrines found in this passage that are not also found in other places in Scripture. That is to say that there are no doctrines which stand or fall with this passage. So whichever camp you find yourself in, the camp that thinks it does belong, the camp that thinks it doesn't belong, this passage does not cause any friction or any theological differences or disparities between the two sides, not at all. In fact, uh, the same is true of all of the textual variants in Scripture. Not a single one of them results in any doctrine being brought into question. Fourth, I want to point out to you that if you were to just skip this passage, if you, if you were to just kind of leapfrog over it from, uh, from chapter 7, verse 52 to chapter 8, verse 12, it actually flows perfectly smoothly and it makes a lot more sense. L let me show you. Uh, it, it ends with the Pharisees having this discussion in verse 52. As it says, they answered him, uh, or they're, they're talking to Nicodemus. They answered him, you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Now let's skip down to verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Now, why is that important? It's because in the text that we're looking at today, the Pharisees leave. And yet here they are speaking, but I thought they left. Well, if you go back to chapter seven, verse 52, they didn't leave. And so it makes a lot more sense if you were to leapfrog this passage. The final point I wanna make, fifth point, I hope to kind of make the case for this not being included. And thus, as we examine it, one of the things I wanna do is show you how many words are in the passage that we're looking at today that are found nowhere else in John's writings. So given how many words are used here that John never uses any place else in any of his writings, and given the fact that this passage isn't found in any of John's manuscripts for the first uh, 300 plus years after it was written, and add to that the fact that not a single one of the earliest church fathers makes a single reference to this text in their own writings, and yet they quote 95% of the rest of the New Testament in their writings, and we've got a pretty solid case. There's a pretty strong case to be made here. So let's go through this, and I'll make some, some comments along the way and, and give some application along the way, and we'll assume that this passage belongs in the text, at least hypothetically, but I'll also show you along the way why I'm not sure that we can say that it does belong. So let's start with chapter 7, verse 53. Everyone went to his home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. Now, the first thing that makes this passage kind of weird is, is that it says that everybody went to their homes. Remember that this, um, that the previous passage took place on the very last day of the Feast of Booths. So the people would have been heading home uh, either late at night or starting very early in the morning, most likely. 
But maybe the idea is that Jesus started teaching before those who had traveled from far distances to Jerusalem had started the journey home. That, that's possible. I just want to point out that it starts out by telling us that the people already went home, uh, but maybe that means that they just went back to their tents uh, that they would set up for the Feast of Booths. Let's continue. Starting in verse 3. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Again, let me just stop and point out just how kind of weird this is. Uh, in, in fact, it's kind of mystical. It's kind of cryptic. Why is Jesus writing on the ground? And what was he writing? If John isn't going to even give us the slightest clue about those things to answer those questions, then why does he share uh, this detail that Jesus is writing on the ground? All of this adds to the case against this passage being included because this is not John's style to give us a detail like this without giving us any kind of explanation or even any hints as to what was it was ultimately all about. In fact, it's kind of indicative of a heresy, an early ancient heresy called Gnosticism, which refers to a secret kind of knowledge, which was a heresy that John specifically warned his readers about in 1 John. So it would be very easy for somebody to say, well, I, I know what uh, Jesus was writing because I have this secret knowledge. So it's just not John's style. I also think it's important to note that this word stooped that we find here in the text is found nowhere else in any of John's writing outside of this passage. John had a very, very simple, a very distinct style of Greek. Uh, and, and this passage just doesn't fit his style or his vocabulary at all. In fact, if, if when you're a student of Greek, uh, usually the first book that you will be given to start translating is the gospel according to John, because John writes in such simple, plain Greek. Um, these words, the, some of the words that we find here are nowhere else used by John. They're not as simple as his typical vocabulary. That's just something that we should be aware of. Uh, let's continue. Verse 7. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, I guess the first thing that I would point out is that there are a couple more words in this verse that aren't used anywhere else outside of this passage in all of John's writings. And those words are persisted and straightened. Uh, you can find those words in this passage nowhere else in any of John's writings. Now, I, I do think it's also worth noting that this does and, and doesn't align with uh, due process according to the Bible, the, the process that the Bible required to accuse someone of, uh, of this particular sin. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22, we read this. We read, if a man is found lying with a married woman, then both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, thus you shall purge the evil from Israel. So, what we should be aware of um, is that the, the Pharisees are not following due process. They're, they're not doing what scripture requires because the man isn't brought before Jesus. Only the woman has been brought before Jesus. But scripture requires that both of them, if one of them is going to be tried, they both have to be tried. And that doesn't happen here. So uh, this actually seems like maybe, maybe uh, something that Jesus would normally have pointed out and brought to their attention, but he doesn't here. And, and that's okay. But, but it doesn't seem possible that this kind of stoning actually ever happened uh, during Jesus's day among the Jews because the Roman Empire, the Roman government did not give the Jews the authority to execute capital punishment on their own. In fact, that's why Jesus had to be handed over to the Romans 
for his execution, for the crucifixion. The Jews didn't have the right to carry out this kind of punishment on their own. Uh, and I think that as we imagine this scenario, you know, you, you probably have a picture of what's going on in your mind. And I think that as we do that, we're kind of prone, perhaps due to the way our own culture has, has influenced us, we're kind of prone to picture the Pharisees as these men who were just crazy and they were chauvinists who just wanted to, to punish the this woman. Uh, but we should notice the reason that they brought her before Jesus. They have brought her before Jesus, not so that she will be in trouble, but so that he will be in trouble. They're trying to trap Jesus. They're not trying to trap this woman. His blood is the blood they want to see shed. She's not so much the object of their wrath. Jesus is the object of their wrath. They're not trying to get her in trouble. They're trying to get Jesus in trouble. She's the bait. They are sure that this same Jesus, who they criticize elsewhere throughout the Gospels for loving and showing mercy to tax collectors and prostitutes, they're sure that he will be unfaithful to the demands of the law. They just want to catch him in the act, just like they have caught this woman in the act, supposedly. But Jesus knows the law. Jesus knows what the Bible says. And when he replies to them here by saying, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. He's actually alluding to the law of Moses himself here. Deuteronomy 13, 9 says, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be the first against him to put him to death. And afterward, the hand of all the people. Deuteronomy 17, 7 says, the hand of the witnesses shall, first, shall be first against him to put him to death. And afterward, the hand of all the people. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. So basically the, the gist that I'm trying to draw out for you guys from, from those, two, uh, those two verses is that the purge person who throws the first stone needs to be an eyewitness. It needs to be somebody who is making a formal accusation against the person. That is what the law of Moses required. So if you're going to bring this accusation of adultery you, you can't be guilty of it yourself. You, you couldn't have, have been a participant in it. Uh, you, can, you must have been a, a, an eyewitness who was removed. Uh, and you must be the one to throw the first stone. So if Jesus had said, well, of course, if you caught her, she's, she's guilty, she's condemned. He would have been violating the law of Moses because he wasn't an eyewitness. So he's found a way out of their trap here. He's, he's found a way out around the snare that they have set for him. So by challenging the Pharisees to be the one, to, to take one of them, to be the one to, to cast the first stone, he was challenging them to do what God requires. He's challenging them to do what is ordered in the law. He's essentially asking, okay, who of you was the one who saw this? Which one of you was the eyewitness? Because the responsibility of throwing the first stone will be on that person. So two things are problematic in the way that the Pharisees are doing this. Number one, where is the man who was participating in this? Because they said they were caught in the act. And who is the eyewitness of this alleged sin? Jesus demonstrates before all these people who are gathered, that these men, these religious leaders, these, these Pharisees, not only have no concern for justice, but they have no regard for God's holy and perfect law. Now, that certainly is something. Whether or not this was, uh, you know, whether or not this belongs in the text, that is something that repeatedly characterized the Pharisees. Pharisees were not people who just loved rules. No, they were people who disregarded God's rules. They were people who didn't care about what God's word said. They wanted to make up their own rules as they went along to replace God's rules. So Christians, you know, we often get called Pharisees, whatever. It's, it's just a word. But 
Christians aren't the Pharisees, even though we get accused of that a lot or called that a lot. The Christian is one who can say with the psalmist in Psalm 119, I love your law. I love your law. While the world, it's the world that does everything that they can to neglect and to violate and to replace God's law. So now with that understanding, who's the Pharisee? The Christian who wants to obey God's law or the world, which has no regard for God's law. It's pretty cut and dry. It's the world. The world, they're the Pharisees. Let's continue, verse eight. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And again, this word stooped is only found in this passage of John's writing, nowhere else. And again, this action is uncharacteristic of both Jesus' actions and John's writings. Why does he write on the ground? What's he writing? We have no idea. And, and here's the thing. We don't have the liberty to just take a guess. We don't have the liberty to ju just take a guess because there are no clues in the text. What God wants us to know, he tells us. He tells us, and there's nothing here. He never leaves us guessing on anything that we should know. Verse nine. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? Again, there's that word straightening, which is only found here in John's writings. It's nowhere else in John's writings. Verse 11, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. I think it's important for us to see here that Jesus is not acting or speaking uncharacteristically there. He's not watering down the gospel and he's also not watering down the need for people to repent of sin. He's not apathetic toward her sin, not at all. He doesn't say, well, you know, hey, she's a consenting adult. Um, you know, who, who's she really hurting? Uh, you know, what's the problem? He doesn't say that. No, he, he doesn't write off the accusation as being irrelevant. Instead, what we see is that he rebukes her. But graciously. He rebukes her and instructs her to repent of her sin. So, so this isn't uncharacteristic of Jesus, not, not at all. Now, some people are really bothered when they're confronted with the possibility that this text doesn't belong in the Bible. Just the possibility. But let me just say this. If I were to, you know how at the beginning of every sermon, one of the things I do every week, right, is, is I say the, the main point of this passage or the main point of this sermon is such and such, right? I do that every week. So if I were to do that with this passage, if I were to summarize the point of this passage, as I always do, it would be something like this. It would be the point of this passage is that there is grace for everyone who comes to Christ in faith and repentance, does that seem fair? Does that seem like kind of an accurate summarization of where this, this text goes and what the main point of this text would be? I, I think it is a fair uh, representation of, of this passage. Now, the question is, can we find that principle, that same beautiful, amazing assurance of God's grace and of God's steadfast love, his loving kindness, toward sinners, toward us. Can we find that in any other passage of scripture? And of course the answer is absolutely, absolutely. I, I mean, it, it's everywhere. You can find it in every chapter. You could probably find it somewhere in every passage. It's everywhere. So the message the point of this passage that we're, that we're looking at today, the one that's in question, is consistent with the rest of the testimony of Scripture. There is grace for all who come to Jesus in true faith and repentance. Repentance. 
Let me give you an example of a passage where, where else we find this principle. Romans 8.1. Romans 8 1 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, I could have just said that that verse summarizes the whole point of this passage here in John. It summarizes the entire central point of the passage that we've been looking at. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. It's from Romans chapter eight, verses one to four. That is the gist. That's the same message that we find in this passage in question here in John. What this tells us, what this reveals to us is that if you are a sinner, and I mean a sinner of, of any flavor, you could be an adulterer, you could be a blasphemer, you could be a thief, a liar, you could be all of the above. If you are a sinner of any flavor, God makes the same promise to you that if you will come to him through faith in Christ, he does not condemn you. He does not condemn you. Instead, his desire, if you will come to Christ, is to bless you. Not just to bless you, but to lavish his blessings on you. He will take your sin and he will deal with it in Christ. He'll take your sin and he will remove it from you as far as east is from the west. He will put all of your guilt and all of your shame and all of your sin on Jesus and he will replace your sin with robes of Christ's own perfect righteousness so that you and I and anybody else who comes to Christ can stand before God, not in our sin, but we can stand before God in Christ's own perfect righteousness as if we were the ones to have upheld the law perfectly and as if Jesus were the one to have committed our sin. You do not want God to deal with you according to your sin. You want God to deal with you according to Christ's perfect, unblemished righteousness. If you believe in Christ, you can know that God dealt with Christ according to our sin. You and I must know, friends, that all of us are as guilty of sin as this woman in the passage was. Even if you say you're not an adulterer, even if you have never lusted for somebody just in your heart with your eyes, James says that if you've broken one part of the law, you've broken the whole thing. So if you've committed any sin, you're a sinner. And you're, you're as guilty of sin as this woman in the passage was. It, it's very difficult, we understand, it's, it's very difficult to catch somebody in the act of adultery, but it's not difficult, it's not a stretch for us to realize that if any of us has ever even lusted after someone uh, other than our spouse, we're as guilty as God's, uh, of, of, of adultery as this woman was in God's eyes. It's difficult for us to catch somebody in the midst of an act like this, but it's not difficult for God. It's not difficult for God. He knows it all. He sees it all. And he cares about it all. 
And for that reason, friends, all that we can do before God is confess that we are as guilty of sin as anyone else ever has been. We can't hide the fact that we're guilty from God. And it is foolish to pretend that we can. And so, come. Come to Christ and trade your sin, trade your shame, trade your sorrow. By faith, exchange it for Christ's perfect, unblemished righteousness. That is what God offers sinners. That's what God offers you and me and anyone else who will come to Christ in faith. And that is what he gives us in the gospel. While Jesus hadn't come to judge or to condemn anyone the first time around, because people are already under uh, condemnation apart from his atoning work, the fact is that Jesus is coming again. And when he comes again, he will judge. And he will judge righteously. He will judge the living and he will judge the dead. And thus all of us will stand before him one day, just as this woman did. But if we have not repented and believed in Christ and believed in him savingly, we will not hear the words, I do not condemn you. Those words are reserved for his sheep. He will separate the sheep and the goats on that great day, and only the sheep will hear the words, I do not condemn you. The question we have to allow ourselves to be confronted with then is who are his sheep? Who are his sheep? Who, who are the ones who will hear those words, I do not condemn you? His sheep are those who hear his voice and follow him. How do you know if that's you, how do you know if you've heard his voice, the fact that you're following him? How do you know if you're following him? You look at what you believe about him and you look at your life and you consider your level of commitment to him. If, you're, if your doctrine is out of line with what the Bible clearly teaches and what the church has held for 2000 years now, you should be concerned. If your life is on a trajectory away from Jesus, and toward an increasing propensity for sin and unrighteousness, then you do need to consider the very real possibility that you're not following him. And that you need to start back at square one. You, you just need to start with the basics. Repent and believe in Jesus. Believe the gospel. Look to Christ and believe in him savingly. But let me remind you, that God's grace is unconditional. Isn't that beautiful? His grace is unconditional. And when I say that, what I mean is his grace is not contingent on anything about us, including changed behavior. Well, let's be honest. Anybody can change their behavior. People in the world, atheists, change their behavior all the time. God offers salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and his grace is not contingent upon our obedience. That can be a very controversial thing to say. But if it were, if his grace were contingent upon our obedience, the only obedience that he could accept, the only obedience that God could find acceptable is perfect obedience. And not a single one of us is ever going to get there on this side of glory. Notice when Jesus addresses the woman, he, he doesn't say to her, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to refrain from condemning you if, if you'll just stop sinning. That's contingent grace. It's not what he does here. He doesn't say to her, go home and repent. No, that's, again, contingent grace. No, he offers her an assurance of pardon on the spot before she's had a chance to show that her behavior can be changed. 
the basis of God's grace is not our obedience. It's Christ's obedience. It's Christ's obedience. Only Christ was perfectly obedient to the will of God. Only Christ perfectly and sinlessly upheld all of the demands of the law. Neither you nor I will ever do what Jesus was able to do as long as we have this flesh nature, which, praise the Lord, we will one day lose in glory. Jesus also doesn't say, go and commit adultery no more. He's not just telling her to turn from one sin. He's telling her to turn from all sin. See, see, it's easy for us to think that some sins are more worthy of God's judgment than others. And there certainly are some sins that God punishes more severely than others, absolutely. But the admonishment that Jesus gives this woman is not to just turn from this specific sin, which is a pretty serious sin, no, his admonishment to her is to turn from all sin. Now, does this passage belong in Scripture? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Either way, what we see is that the principles that are found in this text are found all over Scripture, just in different, different uh, manifestations, different ways of, express, of expressing the same principles. Maybe the only time we'll know for sure if this belongs in the text is when we are one day welcomed into God's presence forever in glory. But if you're going to make it there someday, we need to make sure that we have believed in Christ as he requires. But the point is that there is grace for all who come to Jesus in faith and repentance. God's grace is our motivation for a changed life. When you realize that you have not lived the perfect life of obedience that God requires, and when you look at the life of Jesus and realize that through faith, his perfect life, his perfect sinlessness has been credited to your account. And when you look at his death and you realize that he's died the death that you deserve to die, and you see the grace of God toward you, in all these things, that is what motivates us to change. That is what motivates us to want to live for his glory. If you are in Christ, if you have believed in him savingly, you need to know that you are forgiven, not based on your merit, based on Christ's merit, you are forgiven. God's grace has been given to you. If you have believed in him, God's grace has been given to you as a free gift. You can't render yourself more worthy or deserving of it. And my prayer and encouragement for you today is that when you've wrapped your mind around that, when you consider the way that God has lavished his grace upon you as a free gift in Christ Jesus, that you will love him and that you will desire to walk in his ways more and more. And that you will conversely love and desire sin less and less, and that Christ would be glorified because of the work that he's done and continues to do in your life. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that your grace is so unfathomably great. Lord, whether or not this text belongs in our Bibles, we thank you and we praise you for the fact that we find these principles everywhere, that you deal with us not according to what we have done, but you deal with us according to what Christ has done for us. We could never deserve your grace. We could never earn your grace but it's freely given in your son.
and we thank you for that. We pray that as we wrap our minds around your grace and around the great love that you have for us, that you would call us out of darkness, call us away from our sin and into your light. We pray that as we consider your grace and your love in these things, that our lives would be transformed, that we would become more and more like Jesus, loving your word, longing to, to obey your word, longing to walk in the light with you. Thank you for the privilege of knowing that one day we will. One day we will worship you freely in your presence. We will gather around your throne and we will sing with countless voices your praises and we will worship you as you deserve to be worshiped. Father, we pray that our lives would be transformed, not for the sake of our own behavior modification, but for the glory of Christ. Teach us, O oh Lord, through the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit in us to hate our sin. Teach us not to be comfortable with our sin, but to be very uncomfortable with it and to long to be cleansed of it. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the way that we have been washed clean by your gospel. And we pray that our lives would be transformed because of it. In Jesus' name, amen.